I'm now pleased to introduce Katie Tang, who will introduce our panelists and moderate the discussion on veterans courts. Ms. Tang is the supervisor for District 4 for the City of San Francisco. This very exciting appointment by Mayor Ed Lee happened in February of this year and put her law school career here at Golden Gate on hold. We are looking forward to when she's able to come back um, and uh, complete her degree when the time is right. Ms. Tang previ previously served as Supervisor Carmen Chu's legislative aide for over five years, drafting legislation to create neighborhood commercial districts for District 4, business corridors, and increased protections for victims of domestic violence. As legislative aide, she served as an advisor on policy issues before the Board of Supervisors, served as lead staff in developing the city's first two-year balanced budget, and worked with District 4 neighbors and businesses to implement community improvement projects. Katie also served in Mayor Gavin Newsom's administration in the Office of Public Policy and Finance, where she led neighborhood involvement efforts in the development of the city's first community justice center. Please help me welcome Katie Tang. Well, thank you, Van, uh, Dean Van Cleve, and also thank you for all of you uh, for participating. I do look forward to my return to Golden Gate. Uh, today, I just wanted to um, give you a little introduction um, with the panelists here. So to my right here, we have the Honorable uh, Judge Cynthia Lee. She is the presiding judge of the San Francisco Superior Court. We have Elizabeth Brett, a Veterans Justice Outreach Specialist uh, with the Veterans Administration, San Francisco Medical Center. Kevin Dunleavy, the Chief Assistant District Attorney from Alameda County, and Professor Gary Solis, uh, who was a former Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Marine Corps, who served uh, 26 years of active duty, uh, was a professor of law at the uh, U.S. Military Academy, and is currently an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, and also, I learned, is, is teaching at UC Davis School of Law as well. So with that, I wanted to give each of the panelists uh, about two minutes to briefly state a little bit more about themselves before we get started on this conversation. Um, I'm currently the presiding judge. Uh, I'm actually a graduate of Golden Gate from, I don't think I should tell you the year, because then you'll figure out how old I am. I'm pretty old, um, actually. But um, I spent 22 years in the district attorney's office as a trial attorney litigating all kinds of trials. Uh, in some supervision of uh, different units. Obviously, you can see I didn't do tech at all, and I didn't do media. Um, and I've been on the bench uh, for 15 years. Last year, I was elected by uh, my fellow judges as presiding judge, and I served a two-year term. Uh, and uh, the San Francisco court, as you know, is a diverse court. We have currently uh, we currently have a, uh, a bench of uh, 49 judges, half of which are women. So we're pretty diverse uh, and we have a pretty good cross-section, not only in terms of gender, but in terms of ethnicity. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud of my colleagues. Great, thank you. And Judge Lee recently took me uh, to visit the Veterans Court, so I got to sit in through some of the hearings, and it was a, a really great experience. So thank you, Judge Lee, for that. Liz? Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Brett with the San Francisco VA Medical Center. I've been with uh, the Veteran Justice Outreach Program for the last three years. Um, and with that entails, there's three core components to the Veteran Justice Outreach Program. And that is providing outreach to uh, incarcerated veterans in our county jail, enrolling them for VA health care, providing assessments, and then linking them to services post-release. Secondly, it involves working with the courts and developing veteran treatment courts, and also providing information to the courts regarding a veteran's uh, military status, and then thirdly, working with law enforcement. And here in San Francisco, I've been involved with the crisis and veteran intervention training for the last three years, where we have trained over 200 officers in how to respond to people with mental health um, issues in the community. And uh, we have five, it's a 40 hour curriculum, and five of those hours are um, devoted to veterans' uh, issues. So, thank you. 
Uh, my name is Kevin Dunleavy. I'm the Chief Assistant District Attorney in the Alameda County District Attorney's Office in Oakland. Uh, RDA, uh, like the judge, is also a uh, Golden Gate University School of Law graduate, the NCO Valley. Uh, I've been the, with the DA's office about 25 years. I've spent the majority of my career as a prosecutor in the courtroom trying cases. Uh, but when Nancy got sworn in as the district attorney in 2009, she appointed me her chief assistant. We have about 150 deputy DAs uh, in the office. We have a number of collaborative courts. And about a year and a half ago, uh, we were contacted about our participation in starting a veterans treatment court in Alameda County. I think as the discussion will go on today, you will hear about the different wrangling that goes on in terms of uh, bureaucratic cost to the court. So we got some partners uh, from the Public Defender's Office, Probation Department, and uh, a judge who is a, uh, a Coast Guard reservist. And we are going to be up and running at the end of November. So I guess I'll probably speak a little bit today about how we went through the process to try to start it but I'm also going to learn more by listening because I'm interested to hear about the success of San Francisco. Perhaps we can use that as a model when we, uh, when we begin our court next month. Hi, I'm Gary Solis. I'm still a lieutenant colonel in the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really retired. Um, after my second tour in Vietnam as a tanker, an RPG hit my vehicle and didn't detonate, I said to hell with this, I'm going to law school. <laughs> and I did at UC Davis, where I'm now a visiting professor this semester. Uh, as noted, I did 26 years in the Marine Corps, uh, the last 18 of which I was a judge advocate. I, was, uh, I prosecuted 433 courts martial, and as a military judge, I judged three, 230 additional trials. And then uh, after retirement, I got my doctorate in the Law of Armed Conflict from the London School of Economics and moved to West Point, and I've been teaching the Law of Armed Conflict primarily since then. Great. Well, thank you. As you can see, we have a really great panel today. And so, you know, San Francisco uh, likes to be the first to do a lot of things. Um, while we weren't the first to establish a veterans court here, we are definitely among one of the first. Um, there are about 80 of them across the country today. The first one that was established was actually in 2008 back in New York uh, by Honorable Robert Russell. And so um, today I'd like to start with Judge Lee and just ask you if you can tell us a little bit about the veterans court here in San Francisco, uh, how it got started despite funding challenges, and uh, maybe just also speak to a little bit about um, our collaborative court system here and how that, uh, how that plays into how we were able to establish the Veterans Court. San Francisco is very fortunate. We have many collaborative courts. We have Behavioral Health Court, we, uh, which uh, supervises individuals with mental health issues. We have uh, Drug Court, which has existed in our courts for probably over 30 years. Uh, we also have a Community Justice Court, which is just now celebrating its fifth anniversary. So we have had a, a, an array of collaborative courts. When I came in uh, as a presiding judge in January, uh, I became interested in uh, the possibilities of starting a veterans court. And as you all probably know, the judicial branch has taken an incredible hit in terms of the financial resources available to trial courts. So I was faced with the problem of how do I uh, get up and running uh, a veterans court with zero dollars? Uh, San Francisco downsized and restructured in 2010 and 2011. We laid off 67 employees. We fired all of our commissioners. Uh, and basically all the judges are now doing work that commissioners used to do, from traffic to small claims to dependency, anything that we can think of. So we had undergone a pretty sweeping change two years ago uh, in order to meet our budget woes and, uh, and an effort to tighten the belt. So when I looked uh, at the situation uh, of being interested in doing a veterans court, um, I realized that I was going to have to do it given the financial constraints. The other constraint that we had at that time is we were short five judges. So I knew I wasn't going to take a trial court offline because our business is trials and we need to keep the cases moving through the pipeline. 
without getting a bank account. I knew that I wasn't going to add staff because I didn't have any money to add staff. And I knew that we were running pretty much at capacity because of um, uh, staff sustainability issues. You know, our staff are people, you can only ask them to do so much before they get burned out. Fortunately, uh, I was able to latch on to and kind of, you know, there's, I forget what the name of the fish is, but there's a fish that latches on to the back, I think, of orcas or whales and kind of gets a free ride. So this was kind of the same idea. Um, I had a CJC already in uh, that was working very well, Community Justice Court, that handles uh, area, uh, crimes committed in the Tenderloin. And they're low-level felonies, nonviolent felonies, misdemeanors. Uh, they, at that point, their caseload was about 300 cases, so they were pretty packed. So what I did, because of the fact that I was interested in starting a uh, Veterans Justice Court, is I kind of rearranged the chairs at the table, and we uh, were able to establish a once-a-week Veterans Court uh, under the umbrella of CJC using the same resources. It squeezed the judge some, it squeezed the staff some, but, but I think it's fair to say everyone was very committed to the idea that veterans should have a Veterans Justice Court in recognition of their particular experiences, their particular needs, and also because quite frankly we had the generosity of the Veterans Administration Medical Center here in San Francisco to help us pr to provide additional resources above and beyond the resources that are available to other defendants who are accessing treatment through the Department of Public Health. Uh, I became interested in a uh, Veterans Justice Court. Uh, there was a story, I think, on NPR News. Uh, there was a lot of publicity at the beginning of the year about whether or not there was going to be the drawdown from Afghanistan and some of the problems that were likely to occur. I had also been supervising judge of the criminal division in 2011, and so I was aware certainly that there were a lot of defendants coming into the criminal justice system that were veterans, and the sheriff's department uh, at that time had and still has what's uh, a program called COVER, uh, which is a special unit uh, at San Bruno uh, to house veterans. And one of the things that I found in my work in the criminal division was that uh, encouraging defendants to try to get into the, to apply at that time to, to get into the covered program seemed to really uh, work wonders and affect them when they came back to, in court before me the second time. They were kind of standing taller, they had a better attitude. Some of them, when they came in, their attitude was not so great. Um, but some of it was the influence, I thought, uh, cohort group and the support that they were receiving. And I would talk to them about what happened in cohort. How did they like it because they were in a separate unit? A lot of them had said, you know, I'm not really happy in general population because they're all these kids. And they're all behaving badly and it's making me crazy. And moving them into cover really had an effect on them uh, in terms of, they were just more amenable to programming, more amenable to services they seem. I mean, nobody's happy being in custody. Let's face it, that's just not a good thing. But they seem to have be more settled down. So I was able to latch on to the services that we already had, but at the same time, the downside, because there's always a downside of something, was the limitations of CJC were I imposed uh, as the limitations on uh, the Veterans Justice Court because unless and until it's a standalone court. I didn't feel it was fair to the defendants as a whole to change the rules of the game. And we, frankly, we coached some of the, and peeled off some of the defendants who were in CJC to start as the initial group. I started as a pilot project to see how we would run for maybe four months. We started it in April. The idea kind of germinated and I started talking about it in, I think, maybe February. And drove my staff and the people from the VA mercilessly to get it up and running um, as soon as possible. Um, but I have to tell you, it was only possible for us to do this because of the generosity and the cooperation of the Veterans Administration and Dr. Nichols, who was very committed to it and um, helped us 
uh, in several meetings to be able to realize that this was in fact something that could be uh, could be real. I mean, it's a very exciting prospect to put something together. And one of the things that we found was in talking to the public defender's office and talking to the DA's office um, and talking to our own staff and talking to the other judges, you know, the idea that veterans coming home who happen to uh, fall into the criminal justice system deserve to have this standalone court. And there's nobody that's going to say no to it. I mean, that's one of the most incredible things. We didn't have any fights about it. Everybody was on board right away. The only issue was resources, doing it on a shoestring or less than a shoestring. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judge Lee. And I know that from observing the court as well that the interaction uh, between the judge and the defendant is a very different one in a veterans court compared to an, uh, another type of court. And so that was very interesting to see. Um, and so this question is really uh, a question for all the panelists. Um, you know, in your mind, can you describe for us what, what are some of the key components that you think are essential to a veterans court? And I do realize that every veterans court in every different jurisdiction uh, will be different, but what do you think are some of the key things that, that must be there for it to be effective? I think one of the key components is actually having a peer mentoring program. And actually we started our peer mentoring program in September of this year, which is essentially uh, a group of veterans who are involved with the court um, and they're there to support the veterans that are going through the process. So that support can look like, hey, you can do it, or it could look like uh, taking them to an appointment. Uh, it, you know, it could look like, uh, it's giving them information regarding resources that are out there and available to them. But that is really, really one of the, the core components to the veterans treatment courts. And I think what's, um, it's different about from the veterans courts from the other collaborative courts. Any yeah, other panelists? Well, I, 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 I think that since we're just in the beginning stages, I think that the first thing for any county to consider it is just to find out what is the need. Uh, when we were contacted by Duncan uh, McVicker, who's a, <coughs> a veteran legals coordinator uh, for the state, to try to get us in Alameda County to come up and try to start a veterans treatment court, we actually had a meeting with uh, Judge Gordon Barranco, who like <coughs> Judge Lee in San Francisco is kind of in the key person with collaborative courts. And we were given the, the same line as all counties have with the, with the problems with funding for courts that, you know, maybe you should just start off with, with baby steps. Maybe you should follow the model as to what they do in uh, the San Francisco County Jail System. And we were advised at that time that it was set up in San Francisco that at least veterans that were in custody were at least asked whether or not they were veterans, and they had set up a system where there was a separate pod for veterans to be together. So at least some of the common problems they could have, they would at least be in an area with other veterans. So we thought that that was a good starting point. We called the Sheriff's Department in a, that runs Santa Rita Jail out in Dublin, and they had not done that. So with the work of the Sheriff's Department, we went out, and they identified, they went back and identified how many <coughs> veterans were actually presently sitting in custody. And then Duncan McVicker went out and actually did a survey. He sat down and uh, posed certain questions to them about the nature of their offense, substance abuse problems, and the like. And I think one of the clear things that came out was, uh, you know, veterans, people that choose to serve their country, truly are the best of the best. And they're very proud people. And unless sometimes the question is asked, if they find themselves in the criminal justice system, that might not be something that they necessarily want to volunteer that they are in fact a veteran. That information was given back to the public defender's office. So that was just kind of an initial process to, for us to go through in terms of identifying veterans. As the process has, has gone on, and we have taken the steps along the way, uh, not only in the Sheriff's Department have they changed their intake when people are brought into jail, 
Now the public defender's office is changing their intake when they go to interview a client, that that's going to be the first question that they have so that it's already in the file so that when the case goes along and eventually there's a plea in the case, they can look back to see maybe this would be a person that would be appropriate for veterans court. Can I just add this? You know, one of the things that distinguishes, is a couple of things that distinguish veterans court from normal criminal courts that I think is just stunning. Uh, and it's something I think that I, you know, that, that I think we should be trying with our regular criminal courts, which is, uh, you know, there's an emphasis on the individual and maybe it's because you have a fewer, you have fewer numbers, you don't have this great volume. But there's an emphasis on the individual, the individual needs, and an emphasis on rehabilitation, on reintegration back into society. You know, we are starting to be to, to look at and to have in different arenas in juvenile and also uh, in adult court what's called reentry courts. Reentry meaning from the criminal justice system from whatever the cycle is that you've been in to, to reintegrating back into society as a productive taxpaying member of society rather than just throwing you on the street and saying, okay, here's you know a dollar for the muni or whatever, and then seeing the person get recycled. You know, Veterans Court is different because there's a collaboration between the public defender and the district attorney. <clears throat> While the defendant has a public defender, it's not an adversarial system because everybody is pushing not to win for themselves for each side. They're pushing to win for that individual, that veteran. How do we give that person the best services? How do we fit that person's needs so they don't come back? And I think that is vastly different than what we do in the general criminal court system. There's case conferencing that goes on <clears throat> with the service providers, the DA and the PD and the judge before court to talk about what's happening with the person. And it's a holistic view and a holistic handling of the individual rather than line number seven, you know, what's, what, what have you done, come back in three weeks without really talking. I mean, if you go to Veterans Court, you're, you should go in on Wednesday afternoon and sit in. You'll see a supervisor tanks a great deal of interaction. The judge talking to the defendant, how are you? In some cases, gee, you haven't been going to treatment. I'm a little worried about this. Maybe we need to try something different. So there's an element of compassion, but yet everybody knows they have to toe the line, and they all know what the consequences are if they don't. Another interesting part of uh, a veterans court as a collaborative court, and frankly as a prosecutor, I had a lot of trouble wrapping my mind around, which was, um, you know, when a defendant was successful, had successfully completed the, the task or you know, whatever it was, the judge invites everybody to applaud. Well, I have to tell you, it took me a long time <laughs> as a prosecutor to really wrap my mind around that. And then when you see the look on a defendant's face and you realize it's a positive reinforcement, or they get a piece of candy or a gift card, they, it's a positive reinforcement. And so the lesson of it is, is as adults and as, as some of you who may have children, as I you know, with my own children, sometimes you have to stop using the stick and start using the carrot. In that same spirit in our veterans court for successful uh, participation and successful progress, our judge will reduce the time somebody's on probation, take six months off their probation, reduce the amount of community service hours. On occasion, maybe the deal that was worked out um, or the suggestion was made to reduce the charges. So it's a very creative environment in which to offer incentives to participate, but then again, you know, in one way it's easy because these are people who, you know, as was said by one of our, our you know, Kevin, they they are the best of the best and they, they know how to follow rules and they, you know, they're there and they know that this is a good thing for them. And I, I just want to piggyback on what Judge Lee said. The relationship between the judge and the defendant is really crucial and it's as part of one of the 10 key components of veteran treatment courts. And really, it's it's not just kind of the veteran going off and kind of getting feedback, but really the relationship that's developed between the judge and the defendant that helps the defendant stay motivated and stay connected to treatment. And I also think the quick um, access to care um, and to treatment. And so really, um, at the VA, we're really looking to that when someone's getting out of custody, we are getting them into mental 
mental health and primary care within that first week they walk out the door and that they're transitioning right from custody into residential treatment because we recognize if there's a lapse in time oftentimes that person will reoffend and go right back into the front door what did other jurisdictions besides san francisco and alameda took the steps that we've heard described here i think that the most important thing we've heard is to identify those veterans who are before the court. Veterans aren't asking for a special deal, but on the other hand, they're not insane, they're not incompetent either. But a recognition of the circumstances under which they might be functioning leads to a more compassionate response, perhaps, a more equitable response, perhaps, a more just outcome of their case. Recognition, the first step. I think it's very important. I'm glad to hear that it's being done. And the question is, have you served in the military versus are you a veteran? Just to point that out, because oftentimes people who have served in the military do not identify as veterans. And so if you really want to capture all of those folks who have served in the military, that is really how you want to word your question. Great, thank you for that. And I know, Liz, you kind of mentioned this uh, a bit in your remarks, but um, really the focus is on, again, rehabilitation, making sure that um, you know we try to heal um, some of these veterans. And so uh, if you can speak to some of the more specifics of what, what sort of treatment and supportive programs um, are in partnership with the Veterans Court. Sure. Yeah, you know, we at the VA, um, you know, we've come a long way, and we recognize that we have a long way to go. Uh, we recognize that we cannot do it all, and we rely heavily on our community partners. And so we have contracts with um, various uh, residential treatment programs in the city so that we can transition individuals that are in need of mental health and substance use treatment directly from <coughs> the city into these programs. We also have developed uh, relationships and contracts with uh, community case management agencies because we recognize that some of these individuals need a little bit more hand-holding in getting to appointments and getting their benefits started and kind of just some of the day-to-day -day things. So we are now kind of connecting the individuals that are involved in the court to case management. Uh, we also have um, out at our medical center, we have outpatient PTSD and uh, substance use treatment. So we're linking our veterans to those programs. And we also, um, we actually have programs up in Sonoma, Lake, and Mendocino County. We recognize sometimes getting people out of the city and away from the area that they have such a long history of using, uh, that that helps them have that period of success. Uh, so we are sending some of our folks um, out of the city and into our contract programs up north. Uh, so really we're looking at what, we're constantly at the VA looking at what are the gaps in services. What are the needs of the veterans we're serving? What are the needs of the veterans specifically in the, the justice system? And we're, we're really kind of, that's why we're developing these contracts with these programs. And in looking at programs that are willing to take veterans directly from custody, because sometimes it's a tough sell. People kind of have, there's a stigma to people who, have, who are in the justice system. And so sometimes there's a reluctance or a resistance to take someone into a program and so specifically we're going after those programs and we're saying this is why we really want this contract with you. We would really want you to consider taking these individuals and have a willingness to either go into custody and interview them or be willing to just take them without an interview so that we can really help them access these services. And we also through the Veteran Justice Outreach Program which um, was developed on uh, the VA's five-year plan um, and so uh, homelessness, we developed the Better Justice Outreach Program. And as we're now getting data, this started in 2008, we're now getting enough data to, to support in some of the needs of the veterans who are in the justice system. And one of the things that we're noticing is there's a high number of veterans who are in with domestic violence charges, and, and actually assault and, and violent type charges. And so at the VA, we are now implementing a Man Alive program, which is a, um, a domestic violence program for our veterans who are court-mandated domestic violence treatment. 
so that they can get those resources and services and to help offset the cost to the county so that they don't have to utilize county programs and they can utilize VA programs. Great, thank you Liz. And so I guess this, this next question would be for Kevin since we have you here. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, San Francisco's uh, Veterans Court and of course you spoke a little bit briefly about how it is that um, Alameda County got started, but since it's gonna be launching at the end of November, if you could share with us maybe what are some of the similarities or differences between uh, the courts about to, to take place there? Well, uh, first and foremost, in California, uh, Veterans Treatment Courts and, and having criminal services for uh, veterans, for people who serve in the, uh, in the military, um, is actually codified in California Penal Code Section 1170.9. So that was the starting point for us. So uh, once we met with Duncan McVicker, it was the actual public defender of Alameda County, Brendan Woods, and myself as the two people that kind of strategized to see what buy-in could we get from a particular judge that uh, would not cost uh, the courts too much. Uh, judge Larry Goodman, as I described, is a, uh, is a Coast Guard reservist, and he already has a collaborative court in his courts on Fridays uh, for defendants that are placed on probation for low-level felonies. And it's to get people back on track, to get people to go out and get a GED, to get people to go out and get job applications, and a rigorous thing so that they can eventually uh, be a full, productive member of society. So we use that as kind of the model. We contacted the probation department to see if they were willing to give us a particular probation officer that would serve with us. And actually, the deputy probation officer they, they assigned was a woman who had actually uh, been in the military, had served in the Army, and had a tour of duty in the war in Iraq. So she was a, a person that we added to our, uh, to, we added to our team. In Alameda County, we have our uh, uh, behavioral uh, health coordinator. That person decided that they would volunteer their time to be a part of it. We had the representative from the Sheriff's Department who was the first screening person to help us identify uh, the actual uh, veterans. And then, uh, through the VA, in our study of Veterans Treatment Court, we did think that it was very important to have somebody assigned who would lead this volunteer mentor program. So, we met and we decided to go out and study another uh, Veterans Treatment Court that was up and running. We had heard that a very robust Veterans Treatment Court was going on down in Santa Clara County with Judge Stephen Manley, that they had some 200 clients that were already in the court. We thought that that was a little bit too ambitious for us to start, so we took a look at San Mateo County, and we actually went on a field trip in San Mateo County uh, the judge that uh, mans that court is also a, a former uh, district attorney within the San Mateo County DA's office, Judge Jack Ranzer. And we went down and watched. We got a copy of their protocol ahead of time. We actually went out and looked at protocols of different counties, San Diego County, Placer County. We had San Mateo. And one of the things that really struck me on the day that we actually went down there was the, the, the thing that really impressed me was the mentors within the courtroom. So to be a mentor, and there's a, <clears throat> there's a whole school of thought of this through, through the VA, it's to get veterans who would be willing to give up their time to participate in this veterans treatment court and be there on the given day so that, as it worked in San Mateo, as we saw, as the judge accepted the person who had already been sentenced in another court, it's important to, to point out that the, the, the people that we are going to have in Alameda County, we're not going to have misdemeanor defendants. They're all going to be felons. They're going to be all probation eligible felonies. Uh, not going to be violent or serious felonies. If there is some sort of exception, we will look at that on a case by case basis. And <clears throat> Once the person is accepted to the court, what Judge Granzer said, is there a mentor? And there was about three or four 
that were sitting out in the audience, they raised their hand, they said, yes, Judge, I'd be willing to act as a mentor. So the next step for that particular defendant, he was released from custody, was to set up an appointment and meet with that mentor. And that mentor would be a person that would help guide uh, somebody that they could uh, talk through their problems with and be kind of the initial person between court dates to get the person pointed in the right direction. So uh, as we had many, many meetings on this, the procedure that we come up with, that we are going to start with is the deal itself between a defendant with his defense attorney and the DA is going to be just like it is in our master criminal court. If it's a non-violent or non-serious felony and the person is going to get probation anyway, now as a condition of probation they can get jail time up to 12 months in the county jail. If that person has served in the, in the military and that person has identified that the nature of the crime that they committed relates to some sort of baggage they have from their military service. And I, and I use that term baggage kind of broadly because we're going to treat it broadly. The code actually talks about some sort of specific trauma or specific mental health issue. We're going to, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be really relying on the veteran as they talk about that. The case would then be referred to our court. There would be a team, the same members that I talked about, that would be that would look at that and say whether or not we're willing to accept that. And then it would be referred over to the VA in, in Oakland for them to go through the person's records and actually talk to the person to find out if there really is something going on with this person as to why they committed this offense. And if it's all a good fit, then that person would come to our court and the rest of the, the services, uh, similar to what the uh, judge talked about, Elizabeth talked about, would be our game plan in Alameda County. Thank you for that. And, uh, yes? I, I just want to say with the, the first um, draft of uh, Penal Code 1178.9, it actually was very specific to PTSD in combat veterans. And actually there's been many revisions of this Penal Code and now it's it's broader, and actually, actually, it's mental health as well as substance use issues. Recognizing that oftentimes veterans develop substance use issues related to their time in service. So the next question I have is, um, Professor Solis, uh, Solis, since uh, given your background, just what are your thoughts about veterans' courts and its its impact on veterans or those who have served in the military? I think it's an excellent idea. In the military, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, there is no similar approach, however. Uh, if you're charged with an offense under the UCMJ, if you're a combat veteran, that is merely a, a matter for sentencing rather than uh, guilt or innocence. I think that it's, it's very wise to have programs like these we have uh, heard described for the reasons that I mentioned before that veterans often come into the judicial system, be it a military system or a civilian system, carrying the baggage that might extenuate the treatment that they receive. And I think that perhaps the military would do well. Get on that, Ritz. <laughs> the military might do well to consider an approach like that taken in San Francisco, particularly in Alameda County. I add one thing. Colonel Ryan is here today in civilian clothes, and you might wonder why. She didn't mention it here. It's because the government shutdown prevented her from getting orders here. She came here on her own dime, and she was told that she could not wear a uniform because the government was shut down. So she's here taking personal leave on her own dime. I think that's no worries. course, I think this is the, the reason why we're even having this, this conference in the first place, but why, you know, what do you think is so, why do you think it's so important to have a veteran's court in the first place? Um, and I know that uh, Judge, I mean, all the panels really spoke to it, but just, you know, the reason for it starting uh, here in San Francisco, but elsewhere as well. Well, 
I think for me, uh, it was important to start a veterans court because uh, through my experiences in the criminal justice system as a prosecutor and as a judge and a supervising judge and in doing trials, you know, one of the things that you want to do uh, is to think about uh, in some senses, and usually it happens in trial after somebody's been convicted, you know, what are their life experiences that caused them to be here? And, uh, you know, although the criminal justice system is geared towards uh, a variety of um, uh, goals, uh, you know, rehabilitation, punishment, deterrence, public safety, uh, I felt that it was important for us to recognize veterans as a segment of society and as an increasing number, perhaps, of individuals involved in the criminal justice who are basically should be handled in a way that recognize their prior experience. They are not like uh, perhaps a defendant that's grown up uh, without having seen military service, without having been in combat, without frankly having been exposed to the level of danger. Uh, and these are people who have volunteered to serve and, and I felt that frankly it was something that they deserved. And so I was gonna make it happen. Well, I'll start by saying I just think it's personally the right thing to do. I think these are individuals that served our country and they deserve this opportunity. Um, and what we see with the criminal justice system, it doesn't rehabilitate. And so this offers an alternative and a way to connect people with treatment and help them move on with their lives. And I think they deserve that opportunity. I also want to just point out a couple of things about the, the statistics of the courts that are already up and running here in the country. Um, and which is that veterans who are involved with these courts, uh, they have fewer new arrests and, 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 um, at booking, and they have reduced uh, charges, number of charges, and they have an increase in uh, substance use and mental health treatment through the VA. So we're seeing higher numbers of veterans come in to, um, for services. Um, and we're also seeing improved mental health outcomes for these individuals and <clears throat> lower rates of substance use. So I, I think they are, there is sufficient data at this point nationally to support that these courts are working and they're helping reduce costs to counties as well as improve lives. Well, I would just say as a prosecutor, the role of the district attorney is not just to seek conviction, the role of the district attorney is to seek justice. And a prosecutor, should be just as proud about some great conviction they got in a jury trial as they are about a case that they dismissed before trial because in that prosecutor's review of the evidence, they truly felt that justice would prevail by dismissing uh, the charges against the defendant. And justice does not just go as you bring forth the charges, justice continues on once you sentence somebody. And in uh, the Veterans Treatment Court, we are getting somebody who has admitted to their crime, they're already being sentenced. And I feel that not only it is the right thing, I feel that it is the responsibility of the criminal justice system to look out for uh, those folks who have served this country and to do this. Well, uh, for years, uh, we have been involved in different collaborative courts, drug courts. We do something different in Alameda County uh, that <clears throat> is not cod codified in the penal code. Drug diversion is basically set up for people with simple possession. We've set up a, a special program to target uh, youthful offenders between the age of 18 and 23 that have been uh, charged with possession for sale of offenses offenses that are not wobblers, and we've given those individuals an opportunity to go through a very structured probationary type program that if they successfully complete that, we reduce that sale down to a simple possession, and they can get that type of relief. So when the idea came forward to us, if we are doing all these different things and being creative in the way that we go about sentencing, it absolutely only makes sense uh, that we kind of think outside the box and do what's right, do what's just uh, for veterans. I sincerely believe that the military justice system is 
an excellent system given the needs of the military. It has to be different from that of the civilian community. There has to be an element of discipline as well as justice in the military justice system. At trial, after conviction, there is extenuation and mitigation. And the defense counsel will rise and say to the judge, Your Honor, in sentencing, please, or to the members, the jury, please take into consideration that this accused has a silver star and two purple hearts in making your sentence and judgment. But what about the snuffy who just went over there and did his job? Or she did her job. And they didn't get a purple heart. They didn't get a silver star. They just went over there and got their butt kicked and went through two IEDs or seven ambushes or got hit in an MRAP or who knows what. They don't have anything to say to the members or to the judge. And in that respect, as I indicated before, perhaps the military justice system is falling behind. And the Uniform Code of Military Justice, I should point out, is federal law. And Congress can change it. Perhaps they should. So we do have a lot of students here today. And so I'm wondering for the panelists um, if students want to be involved in this, or even folks who um, are not in school right now but are um, actually out there working, um, how, how can they be involved in some of these efforts, um, helping with veterans, whether through the court or other um, rehabilitation programs? Well, I, I will say before I became the chief assistant, for, for years I was the uh, director of, of recruitment and development for the DA's office. And really the main way one gets hired as a deputy DA in Alameda County is to go through our summer law clerk program. <clears throat> Many DA's offices and government offices, unlike civil firms that students will go to between their second and third year that if they perform well, they'll have an offer in hand. Most government agencies don't do that because of the unpredictability of budgets year to year. We've always thought to attract the best students is to prioritize and to have a summer program that as you go through the selection process and we interview some 200 students, we invite 40 back for a callback interview, and then we select between eight and 10 clerks in our summer program. And we'll have to say last year we had eight and a quarter of them were from Golden Gate Law School and they were excellent. Uh, those students come in and because they've taken evidence, they come in as certified law students and we do have a little bit of a crime problem in Oakland. We have a, uh, we have a lot of trials to go around. So we actually treat uh, these uh, law courts really as deputy DAs for the summer. Uh, under the uh, uh, program through the state bar, uh, one can be, through the practical training of law students, uh, one can go to court under our supervision and put on all sorts of different types of evidentiary hearings, and they do during the summer. They put on court trials, they put on uh, motions to suppress, they put on preliminary hearings, and uh, each uh, law clerk gets a chance to try their own misdemeanor jury trial, so it's a, an actual wonderful program. I think that it's absolutely critical for students uh, while they're going through their legal education, even if they were going to be uh, civil lawyers, to get some exposure to the criminal justice system. And that works with both the public defender's office and the DA's office. I did both during law school. And uh, we are just in the baby steps. Uh, yeah. I, I'm working on, on getting uh, veterans into the court, I, my, the next step would be how much help we would need along the way, but uh, certainly my contact information would be available, and we can certainly, uh, if students want to get involved, we would be uh, more than happy to, to uh, avail ourselves of that. Here's one area where the military may exceed the civilian community. We have a tremendous program for law school graduates. I think the recruiting office is uh, just down the street. If you want to sign up for four or five years, you're welcome to come in. But I'm afraid that in the military there isn't any there isn't any provision for students to intern. Uh, once you have, uh, and it's very difficult to become a judge advocate these days because so few judge advocates are getting out. They're staying in because of the economy. Very few slots are open, so. Whereas when I came in back in the 60s, if 
you could fog a mirror you were in, but now it's it's three or four a year to the Navy. It's, it's an unbelievably tight market for anyone to even enlist. And so I'm afraid there aren't many opportunities for law students in the military. Yeah, so I just want to say we do, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, have our peer mentoring program, and so we certainly are looking for uh, those of you who are veterans who want to uh, volunteer to be a mentor in our uh, Veteran Justice Courts. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about that potential opportunity. Uh, and we also, at the VA, uh, we have noticed that oftentimes our veterans become involved in the justice system due to their uh, untreated uh, non-criminal legal needs. Uh, so what we have started to do is to develop legal clinics at the VA. Let me first say we do not do legal, we're not attorneys, and we do not provide any type of legal advice. But what we will do is we will create a space for attorneys to come in and support our veterans with their needs. And so we actually have um, just recently developed a partnership with uh, in, uh, Berkeley, with uh, their law school uh, vault, and so they're coming and they are doing a legal clinic um, addressing um, service upgrades uh, over at our medical center at 43rd and Clement Street. We also have a partnership with Swords and Plowshares and their attorneys, and they're training various corporate law firms on how to assist and support our veterans with service upgrades as well. So we actually have that clinic twice a month at our, uh, at our downtown clinic, which is at 401 Third Street. Um, and I actually have been uh, talking with Dean Van Cleve about an opportunity to work with Golden Gate Law School. And potentially, um, as was mentioned earlier, the San Francisco County Jail has a veterans pod covered, stands for Community of Veterans Engaged in Restoration. There's up to 48 veterans sitting on that pod who have needs. And so the idea is, um, is, you know, can we get some type of clinic up and running there to start that process pre-release? Um, pre in terms of the court, you know, we, we do have our uh, intern, uh, extern program, and we have had a lot of really wonderful students from Golden Gate. Um, you know, we, we only have one judge who is doing veterans court. Uh, I, I just asked Liz if he has a, uh, an intern, uh, and she didn't think so, so there may be a spot available uh, if Judge Woods would like to take uh, on uh, a law student. Um, I do know that every spring, I think it is, there is a program called Stand Down, which is a uh, legal services kind of fair that's run in the East Bay. Several of our judges participate in that yearly. And it is uh, lawyers and people who with legal expertise basically gathered in one place uh, on one Sunday or Saturday all day. Uh, and basically uh, veterans with different kinds of legal issues, whether it is child support issues or civil matters can walk in and uh, take advantage of free legal advice. I don't have all the details on that, but I'm happy, I'd be happy to find out and give the information to uh, Rachel. Great. Well, thank you. So uh, before I open it up to questions from all of you, I do want to give the panelists uh, some time if you have any final remarks that you'd like to comment on. The only thing that I would say is that I'm really gratified to see this many students here day when normally you probably would be outside enjoying the sun. Um, I think the Veterans Court is an idea whose time has come. I think it's an important step for each court to take, depending on the resources we all have. Alameda's resources and where you are in the program, what you have available is different than what San Francisco had to enable us to get a start. But I, I think it's an important first step in recognizing and addressing the needs of people who have served their country. I think um, as uh, our court starts to grow, I, I'm looking to expand it, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, to include a greater range of areas in San Francisco. And uh, I will be looking at including a greater range of charges, including domestic violence, which is... Yay! <laughs> she's, been working, she's been working on me relentlessly since March on this particular issue. So. Um, 
uh, she's not got the goal yet, but she's she's getting there. Just with this public pronouncement, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have a vote in there. Yeah, okay. yeah you know, <clears throat> I'll just give kind of one final little anecdotal thing that I thought about that maybe shows the difference between somebody who's a veteran and uh, you know, an average person that's in the criminal justice uh, system. We had a meeting yesterday just of uh, uh, representatives from the court. So we really limited this to the, the representative from the probation department, Judge Goodman, the public defender, myself, and the main calendar deputy from the DA's office that's in that court. We're going to, we're going to start off slowly. We're going to limit it to about 25 uh, defendants to start things out. We're, our target date is going to be once a month. It, our first date is going to be Friday, November 22nd. And the probation officer said, you know, I've already identified somebody who has gone through, has already gone through their preliminary hearing. It's up in the main superior court. In fact, the person has already pled to their offense, so that fits all the things we're getting people post-conviction. And it was for a commercial burglary, 459 second, which fits, not a violent or, or serious felony. Uh, somebody that had, had broken into a commercial establishment. So I was listening to this, and the person wants to, would, wants to come to veterans court. So I asked the question, I said, well, what's the actual sentence for the defendant? And they said, well, when they come back for their actual sentencing date, they're getting credit for time served. They'll be out, they'll be placed on probation. Well, we have so many probationers in Alameda County, that person, based on that offense, would likely be banked. They would have a probation officer, but not anybody that they would necessarily see. And I said to myself, well, and I asked the question, well, why does this person want to come to Veterans Court? Because most people in that circumstance in the, in the world of criminal law, if they've got credit for time served and they're placed on probation, they're done. They don't have to come back to court. And that question was posed to this veteran who said, you know what, I've had these substance abuse problems since I came back. There are different things going in my life. From what you told me about services that are available in this veterans court, I want to go to it. So that is really shows the difference, and it all really shows the need as to why we need a veterans court. And as Jed, the judge said, hey, DAs, you always think about we carry the stick, and we do. But the carrot is very important. Why shouldn't this person, as the carrot as they go through, get their probation terminated earlier if they're showing success, if they're going, if they're addressing their substance abuse, and ultimately have this case dismissed down to a misdemeanor? which you can because it's a wobbler, so that as this person goes out and wants to find a job, whatever, that this mark or whatever that they have is not going to be something that stops them for the rest of life. That's, that's really, if that's going to be our first case, then I think that's a good example as to why we need a veterans court in Alameda County. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say, historically speaking, the, the VA, if someone was incarcerated, whether it be county jail or state prison, it was kind of hands off, and it's when they get out back, when they re-enter in the community, they will kind of treat. Um, and thanks uh, to Secretary Shinseki uh, for implementing the Better Justice Outreach Program in this five-year plan to end homelessness. We now have a place in the jails, and we can start this process pre-release to get veterans who deserve this this opportunity. Um, link for um, to treatment, and I, uh, I want to also acknowledge my medical director and the top leadership of the San Francisco VA, who from day one, I walked into the VA and I was in a meeting and I, I got pulled out of the meeting saying that the chief of staff wants to meet with you, and essentially she grilled me for you know 45 minutes on what qualified me to be here and to do this work. Um, and has marched into presentation after presentation and meeting after meeting with me to kind of really kind of show that the San Francisco VA was absolutely committed to supporting this population and was willing to put resources in um, to this court and into this population. And if there's things that we were not, services that were not being provided, that we would go after those services. 
Um, and then I have worked with collaborative courts for the last 10 years, previous to the VA, I was working closely with Behavioral Health Board. And I feel very fortunate that the San Francisco is really so open to the idea of collaborative courts and offering people an opportunity to change their lives. And so I just really feel very fortunate um, to be a part of this um, process and this program and, and to be here with you all today because I really believe in it and I think it is the right thing to do. Well, thank you to all the panelists. And uh, now I would like to open it up to anyone who has any questions. This is a question about um, specifically San Francisco's uh, veteran court. Do you think that limiting the jurisdiction to the tenderloin is something that can cause more mistrust on veterans that are coming back? That you capture the modern era of veterans, or do you have a different demographic? And there's already been a lot of distrust between veterans and the VA. Is this something that exacerbates it by making an announcement that you have a veterans court that's really very geographically limited? Let me take the first part of that, which is um, the veterans court that we have now, I started as a pilot project because uh, I wanted to make sure we had all our ducks in line before we started to take on something larger and also to see what the result would be in terms of staff sustainability uh, and whether there were going to be any issues because I said, as I said, I, you know, we're operating this on zero dollars. Um, early on, you know, we talked about the geographical limitation uh, and that exists mainly because I had to put it under the umbrella of CJC because I was not going to take the trial court offline. I mean, we already have many collaborative courts that are full-time courts. These are courts that operate five days a week. It's not just on a Friday or a middle of the week. Behavioral health court slash mental health court operates five days a week. Drug court has three, three days of operation a week. CJC is five days a week. They do the custodies at the Hall of Justice at 8.30 in the morning. Then Judge Wood gets in his car, goes back over to 575 Polk Street to prepare the calendar with the case uh, conferencing before they go into session in the afternoon. So these are full-time courts. So what my plan was, was to see how it would run as a pilot project and then to expand it. And it's my hope, uh, you know, I've been working with, with VA, with Liz and with Dr. Nichols to get enough staff on the VA side and to get enough staff on our side to be able to expand it to different areas. It's my hope by the end of the year that we're able to expand areas such as the Mission, Bayview, and gradually to eliminate the geographical limitations so that hopefully one day, I don't know if I can get it done before the end of my two-year period, but hopefully one day be able to open it to all citizens in San Francisco. So the geographic limitation is one which um, is there because of the startup nature of it, but I, I believe that eventually it'll go away. I don't know if I can make it happen in two years, putting a lot of pressure on a lot on a lot of people, but that would be my hope. Right, and our court started in uh, April 2013, right? So yes. pretty recent. Any other questions? Yeah, my name is Steve Conanty and I work at the state capitol as a veterans advocate and I think it's important we not keep dancing around why we're doing veterans treatment courts. And everybody did a wonderful job. We're doing this because it's the U.S. government that put these men and women in harm's way and asked them to go fight for their country. And as the colonel said, some of them have been there seven or eight times. In Vietnam, my generation, we went for one year. Many, many Vietnam veterans are still messed up. So we got a lot of ticking time bombs out there. But everything you're doing, so that's why we're doing this. Because many of the things that cause them to go or get involved in the criminal justice system is because of what happened to them while they were in the military. And so keep doing what you're doing. But my concern, which I think the Colonel mentioned, not everybody can get into a veteran's treatment court. And 
Some people suggest that you're cherry picking veterans that you know will succeed. So I just want everybody to be clear that 11, Penal Code 1170.9 can be used anywhere in the state. Any veteran and their attorney can use 11 and 70.9. You do not have to go through a veteran's treatment board. So how are you addressing the regular veterans that get into the criminal justice system? But, uh, so through the Veteran Justice Outreach Program, we're not only serving veterans who are in the veteran treatment course. So we are in the jails weekly. Um, we get a list from the, the county jail twice a month of all veterans. They give us identifying information so we can determine their eligibility, and then we go in and meet with them and help them access services. So we are not just kind of singling out those in the, in the veterans treatment court. We really are focused on incarcerated veterans. Um, I actually have a coverage area, the San Francisco VA coverage between San Francisco up to Humboldt County. Uh, so I am actually in and out of jails up the road. Uh, and we don't have courts in, in those um, counties. And, um, but we are going in to the courts and working with the courts and with individuals who are incarcerated to help them link to services. So they, they are getting services, but unfortunately they're just not getting into the veterans treatment court. And I think that is the best, the best way to organize those services, but I do recognize that not everyone's able to come in due to charges or for whatever reason. Uh, in San Francisco, the way our criminal division is organized, I have one judge who does all of the um, case settlements, plea bargains, plea negotiations. And he's very much aware of 1170.9 and will, on a case-by-case -case basis, basically, address the needs of each individual defendant. And I'm uh, absolutely positively sure, since we do have a public defender in Veterans Court, that the public defender and the DA's office are both aware of the applicability of that section. So we do it on a case by case basis, um, we have you know we haven't really gotten any complaints about um, disparate treatment. Uh, I mean, I maybe we will, but I, I kind of doubt it. The other thing I will say is that um, we recently hosted uh, Senator Lonnie Hancock uh, in connection with court funding, and we had her. We were fortunate. Um, that we had her for most of the day, and uh, as one of the places that we stopped, I brought her over to Veterans Court to look at it. Uh, I couldn't get her out of there. <laughs> we had five places. We, we, we had her to our Youth Garden Center, Hall of Justice, Dependency Court, Veterans Court. We had a full, uh, a full range of tours, and uh, she was very interested in it, and I would not frankly be surprised if there was some sponsorship or perhaps some legislation uh, to address the issues of veterans coming from uh, from Sacramento under her leadership. I saw a question there. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious because Kevin and I have worked a lot in trying to organize, uh, I think, a lot of mentorship within the community and we also have a lot of lawsuits who are interested in doing something. We just haven't had real problem trying to get them to do what exactly. So we, we worked with, we coordinated with some undergrad students, some student veterans organizations throughout the entire community who want to work and do these kinds of things. And we feel like rescuers would also be able to help them in return. So I guess my direct question is, what exactly can we do to help move this forward? Because a lot of these things that we've, that we've been kicking around cost nothing. In fact, we also have been working on trying to develop a nonprofit organization that can receive public funds, or I'm sorry, private funds, put towards the veterans treatment board, specifically here in San Francisco. What can we do to support both VA and you? Uh, you know, for our for our veterans treatment court right now, we, we are not soliciting outside funding. Um, again, because we're at the stage of it being a pilot project. Uh, you know, I I I don't know kind of what the future is going to bring, but as we grow it, obviously we'll be looking for probably some outside help. Uh, you know, the, the courts are in an extremely, are extremely in a, a sensitive position in terms of their funding right now. Um, so it's something that, uh, you know, I, I can't give you any definite answer on. Um, if we're able to grow it the way I would like to within the next year, then certainly we'll be looking at, you know, outside.
outside funding maybe be able to, to figure out how to uh, increase the court's services and court days. Uh, but I have to tell you, it's primarily dependent on the stranglehold that uh, Sacramento has on our money right now and on down to the judges. You know, I, we closed 10 courtrooms, uh, 11 courtrooms rather, between 2010 and 11. Ten of those courtrooms are still closed. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing, a conundrum, but in L.A. they close courthouses and they have judges that are sitting in office buildings because they don't have places, court, courtrooms to sit in. San Francisco has the opposite problem. I've got ten empty courtrooms and I don't have any judges. So, you know, were we to get a full range of the judges that we need, I might be able to, at that point, think about um, having a standalone court with one judge and one court. But until that happens, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like that. We're taking it by baby steps, or different baby steps, but I think uh, we have to kind of be cautious in this day and age because of the money. Okay, any other questions? I'm wondering of the panel members, uh, how each of you got involved in veterans advocacy, uh, particularly if you were not a veteran yourself? I am not a veteran. Um, I got involved in it just, I think, in a general awareness of what we can do to uh, try to uh, rehabilitate and, and reduce recidivism. I mean, I, I've been in the criminal justice system as a DA and trying criminal cases for 35 years, and frankly, the revolving door of people we see coming in and out, many of whom have more substantial problems than we are addressing, you know, is, is, is it's shocking and it's sad. Um, and I, I have to say, you know, it was a combination of all the um, news stories and, and thinking about veterans coming home and also because I was aware of the cover program and I had spoken to some of the veterans who faced serious, serious criminal charges when I was in the master calendar. Uh, it just made me realize, you know, we, we have to, in the criminal justice system as in the civil justice system, but to a lesser degree, we have to think outside the box. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the courts in general, uh, Although we are having a financial crisis, I think in some sense it's, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to think about how we do business. Do we need to do business the same way? What creative and innovative ways can we uh, put together on zero dollars to be able to get a different result if we don't like the one we're getting? So for me, it was, you know, and, and it, 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 I find it to be very rewarding. You know, when I go over on Wednesday, I just, it just, you should go over Wednesday at 2 o'clock. It is an amazing experience. So, for me, it's easy. I'm a social worker, and that's what I do. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I came to the VA three years ago, and, and as I had mentioned, I had a previous history working with the collaborative courts. It's a model that I believe in. I have seen it change so many um, people's lives. Um, I truly believe that veterans who serve our country deserve this opportunity. Um, and so it, it, to me, it's, it's really easy and it really just makes sense. Um, and it is, as, as mentioned previously, it is the right thing to do, I, I do believe, so. Well, I'm, I'm not a veteran, but like veterans, uh, I am good at taking orders. So uh, <laughs> I became the person that was the designee uh, but I will have to say that uh, since I helped manage the personnel in the DA's office, once I got involved with it, I could easily assign somebody else to be the uh, DA person when the court is up and running next month. But I, I have learned so much about it, I think it's such a wonderful idea that I'm going to be the DA of the chosen court office. Having been at West Point for a number of years, I had a student who I met uh, last year. He was out of the Army now, he had three or four tours overseas, and uh, I ran into him on the street in Washington, D.C., in Washington, D.C., and it took me about two minutes to realize that he was screwed up, and that made me aware of the issue, but it wasn't really until I came to King Hall at UC Davis as a visiting professor this year that uh, I encountered the veterans organization there and realize how much there is to be done. So it's student involvement, 
Uh, Judge Lee, when I was on your court website yesterday reading about the uh, Veterans Court, I was really impressed uh, when there's a feature where, as one of the rewards, a veteran can go out to lunch with uh, the judge. Do you have any sense of how meaningful those interactions have been for the veteran or the judge? And uh, Mr. Dunleavy, is that a feature that your court would consider having? Well, thank you for pointing me to the direction of the San Francisco website. We, <laughs> we love to steal ideas, and the judge that we have in the court is a great guy. And I think that's. I, you know, I, I, part of the success of veterans court, like any collaborative court, really depends on who the judge is. And, and if the judge does not have the right personality and doesn't have the right attitude, is not the right fit, you're going to end up with more problems than, than you're going to. To, to have solutions. Part of my job as a presiding judge is to make the assignments. I decide who gives where from complex litigation to traffic, it, I, it's my decision. And so um, when I look to see you know, who we would have in Veterans Court, I mean, there were a number of different judges, frankly, that volunteered for it that wanted it. Um, and everybody had a good reason. I knew I was placing it under the umbrella for now of CJC, and I had placed in CJC a former DA, Braden Woods, who used to prosecute homicide cases. Um, and he has, you know, sometimes a pretty rough veneer, but I, I've known him for some time. Uh, he's prosecuting cases in front of me, homicide cases in front of me, and uh, I knew that his demeanor would be the right one, which is a combination of toughness, but kind of caring and compassionate, uh, and he is very straightforward. He doesn't mince words, he doesn't beat around the bush. If there's something that's on his mind, he will tell you in a nice way, but he'll tell you, and he's firm, and he'll hold the line. And those are all qualities that I thought would be well suited at, uh, to veterans court uh, because of the fact that, you know, this the compassionate part of it, that you have to hold the line, you're, Kind of in a sense, you know, I don't mean this with any disrespect to the military, but you're kind of the commander in chief of the courtroom. And you have to be able to act accordingly, but you also have to know that you have to sometimes be able to apply the carrot and not the stick. And he's very good at it, and um, he's asked for the reassignment again for next year. So, um, and, and, and watching the interaction, he's just really good at it. You know, so, but you have to think about who you're going to put in there because somebody that is overly harsh or, <coughs> on the other hand, someone that's kind of a bleeding heart, those are just the wrong combinations. You need the right kind of mesh, but you also have to have, to have somebody that can look somebody in the eye and talk to them. One of the things that I noticed when I've been over there is that he looks the person straight in the eye, tells them to stand up and look at him, that eye contact. Uh, in order to make that connection. I mean, he's just really good at it. Can I, and just to add one thing, I actually got an email recently from one of our veterans in vet court, and he's actually in residential treatment in Sonoma County, and he actually emailed me. He's like, Judge Woods wants to take me to lunch, and he was really excited. And in San Francisco, in our, in our court currently, the average number of incarcerations is 20. Um, and so these are individuals that are not unfamiliar to the criminal justice system. And so they do appear uh, before a judge quite often and frequently. And so to have this type of um, connection with them and not an adversarial relationship that they're used to is quite different. And I think the response has been actually quite positive, actually. Yeah, I mean, there's an element certainly when the connection is made that, you know, the, the defendant in some instances will kind of uh, articulate, gee, I'm sorry I let you down. So that is kind of a, a symbol of what's what's going on. It's not just a judge and defendant, but there's, there's an investment, okay, of uh, human capital that flows both ways. All right. Well, I think that um, there may be just a few more questions, but since we're a little bit short on time now, I just wanted to uh, really thank each of our panelists for the time that they took out of their day today to share with you uh, some information about the Veterans Court and just veterans in general. Uh, and I certainly learned a lot through this process. So I want to thank all of you for being involved in this, have your interest in this issue, 
and for having us here at your first annual uh, Veterans Law Conference at GGU. So thank you very much, and uh, look forward to uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if there's a few minutes to, uh, for some interaction, but I'll bring back the Dean, and thank you so much for having us. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Katie, for uh, moderating. Great job. Uh, we will now um, have lunch up on the fifth floor, room 5309, and um, we have our keynote speaker over the lunch hour, Professor Kendra Rotunda. So please join us up there. It's supposed to start about noon, but um, please join us up there. Again, thank you so much. We really appreciate it.